first, a word about the Field and Garden Podcast. The Field and Garden Podcast is a part of the Gardener's Workshop. The Gardener's Workshop has been telling the stories and how-tos of growing, selling, and helping others to pursue their flower-growing dreams for over 25 years. What began as one gardening enthusiast sharing her passion has grown into so much more. Over at thegardenersworkshop.com, find in print with our blogs and books and through our podcasts and videos and courses, and we have a shop full of the same tools, seeds, and supplies that you hear mentioned on our podcast. You can connect with all of these resources over at thegardenersworkshop.com. I hope you'll take some time to explore all we have for you. Welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. Hi folks, and welcome to Ask the Flower Farmer Live. You might be tuning in expecting to see Lisa here, but I'm filling in today to answer your questions about flower farming. With my online class with Gardener's Workshop and Lisa's class, Lisa's is the basics and mine is the uh, bulbs, perennials, woodies, and more. So let's see, I've already got a question there, it looks like. It sounds like what you want to do is you want to overwinter your dahlias in your raised beds, which will work easily because you're a 9B, which the dahlias will overwinter there, no problem. <clears throat> but you're asking if you can move some of them now to rearrange the beds, so to speak, or, or consolidate some colors. You could do that. You'd be best to wait till they've died back. Um, or if they have, if you don't get a frost on that die back naturally, go ahead and cut them back, wait about two weeks and then dig them, move them. But you, what you want to do is to dig them and just replant them right away because you're in zone nine. It's basically you're storing them in the ground for the winter, but dig them up and replant them right away. If you're thinking of dividing them at all, you want to divide them and let those cut surfaces dry out and cure over for three or four days in a, a warm, uh, dry area, and then you can replant them. You never want to divide a dahlia and plant it right away because you're leaving that exposed cut surface, which could then uh, cause a rot or disease problems. Um, we're now in the middle of October. Um, hopefully, if you're doing the cool season flowers, the cool flowers, that you've got them all in the ground or started soon, unless you're really far south and you still have another few weeks to wait. It might be getting too late if you're up in like Minnesota, you know, Canada and Maine and places like that. And if you didn't get them planted now, you can always plant those cool flowers really early in the spring when it's still cool out. Things like larkspur, bachelor buttons, um, bells of island, things that like a cool start. You can always still do those really late winter, early spring when the weather's still cool. Ah, uh, yes, uh, good question. Treating glads for thrips, best practice. Um, thrips are a tough one to get rid of. Thrips like it warm and dry. So usually you don't have the thrip problem early on. It's usually midsummer, probably July, August, and maybe even early September that you have thrip problems. Um, there are some beneficial insects you can get to uh, help eliminate thrips, um, but you'd want to get those beneficial insects released into your garden before the thrips are a major problem. The other option is to spray in chemicals. Uh, oils and such don't work because the thrips are down deep inside the flower bud or in the plant, and you're never going to con contact them with the spray of the oil or the soaps. So you do have to start using a chemical spray. Um, another thing is if you're saving your tubers and replanting the following year, there's a treatment you can do to the unplanted corms before you plant them in the spring, which is dipping them in a solution that has Lysol, the disinfectant Lysol, um, that comes in the brown bottle, the liquid, not the spray, but the liquid Lysol. Now, if you just Google Lysol gladiola thrip on Google, you'll find the right uh, proportions for that. But if you get a bad infestation of thrips on your glads and you're seeing damage on the buds, it's usually too late to save them, unfortunately. Um, I would like to plant my tulips this year in raised beds. How deep do they need to be? The zone uh, five. Tulips still should be planted six to seven inches below the surface of the soil. And if you're in a raised bed that's made with wooden rails or wooden walls on the side, you want to have this be like a two by six <clears throat> at least so that you're then put your bulbs down in the bottom of the thing and then add uh, more soil on top of it. The other thing you want to remember is you don't want to plant right up against the edge of a raised bed that's made with like one by sixes or a boards because the edges are going to freeze and thaw every day. So you want to come in about four or five inches from the edge of the bed and then can plant there. But even if in a raised bed, you still want to have that about six or seven inches of soil over top of the bulb when planting tulips. Um, 
This is Stone Circle Flowers. I'm in zone six. I grow Lysianthus in a three season greenhouse, so like a probably a high tunnel more than a heated greenhouse, um, in crates. I grow many varieties. How I, I'm having a little trouble with this celeb series. The plants are growing well, but then the flowers become floppy. Is there something I can do to, uh, to stop everything else to support it with netting? It could be that the celeb just does not have as strong of a stem. Make sure you have uh, that you're fertilizing them and use something that has some uh, calcium nitrate. Calcium nitrate helps keep stems stiffer. I know growing lilies is really helpful and uh, some other bulb crops and it should help stiffer stems on the celeb uh, lysianthus. Then the other thing is, um, I don't know what your spacing is. Lysianthus is usually spaced about six inches apart, so like one plant for every square of the support netting. You can sometimes do as many as two per square, but sometimes if it gets too crowded, um, they try and outgrow each other and the stems get weak. So you might try spacing them a little bit farther, no less than six inches apart. And the other thing is you say you're in zone, I forget what zone you're in, zone six, you're probably not using shade cloth on your tunnel, but if you did have shade cloth, that would cause them to stretch and also have weaker stems. Um, so I wouldn't do any shade cloth if you might be doing that. Um, Garden Journey wants to know, how do I handle sowing pelleted snap seeds different than the regular? It's really no different. What it is is this uh, snapdragon seeds have been pelleted to make them easier to count. And also for um, precision seeders or automatic seeders that work with a vacuum pump to place the seeds in a plug tray. Um, just makes it much easier to handle. You still put them on the surface, um, but because snapdragons, you don't bury them, the trick is you need to get that pellet wet enough so it dissolves and it'll basically wash away and be gone without dislodging the seed. So as you can't take a heavy spray of water to water the uh, snapdragon, pelleted snapdragon seeds because they'll wash them out of the, the tray or off your soil block. So you want to use it like a, almost like a mister and mist them until you see that pellet dissolve and then you'll, your seed will be right on top of the surface. Um, this is Heaven Sent Flower Farm. What perennials would you suggest to start with in Texas Zone 8B? Um, zone 8B, you're probably too mild in the winter to grow peonies, which peonies is my number one perennial. Every cut flower grower should be planting those as soon as they can. Um, but Zone 8B, you probably don't have enough cooling hours in the winter. Um, I believe that you have to have at least 40 days below 40 degrees. I'd have to double check that, but you need enough cold winter days to vernalize the plants from them to grow and bloom well. So if you can't do peonies, my next one would be Baptisia. Baptisia likes the, the, doesn't mind the summer heat. It's kind of a three season flower you, or three, three season plant because you get the cut flowers in probably where you're at in Texas in late May. Then you have the foliage you can cut on all summer. And if you didn't sell all the flowers, the seed pods are also usable. So I would go with Baptisia. Um, another great one is Sedum. Loves the heat, Sedum Autumn Joy. Doesn't mind it dry. And then uh, yarrow, both the coronation gold or the uh, moonshine. They're both yarrow or achillea type uh, plants that are grown from cuttings, not from seed. Uh, so you would have to buy liners for those. And liners is just another name for a plug that's grown from an unrooted cutting. So uh, we do the yarrow, coronation gold or moonshine. Both of those are great as a fresh flower in early June. And then they can also be dry. They dry really well. Any tips on germinating Baptisia seeds or should I purchase plugs? For the Baptisia, the only variety you can get seed for is the original Baptisia australis, which is the purplish blue color, more blue than purple. All the other really cool colors, the mauve, the peach, the there's a vanilla, a white one now, there's yellow. Uh, this is Little Meadow Flower Farm. Out in Willamette, I probably said that wrong. I don't know how you sell it, Willamette. Valley in Oregon, out where they grow the tulips and a lot of agriculture out there. Do you know the pros and cons of soaking versus not soaking ranunculus for fall planting? Our winters are wet. Do you think they would survive the wetness if you protect them from the cold? The purpose that you're, the reason you soak ranunculus is to rehydrate them. I always like to say, compare it to a piece of macaroni. It's all dry and hard. You cook the macaroni or soak the ranunculus and it rehydrates, it puffs it up and it uh, gets it all, the moisture back in the, the, the root of the plant. So it's really important to pre-soak them, even if you have a rainy, damp area where you're growing them. But I also wouldn't recommend growing them out in the open because especially in the Pacific Northwest, it might get too wet for them over the winter and they will still rot. So to me, the best thing for ranunculus, they should always go into a high tunnel 
or you can do a low tunnel that's just a, you know a, a caterpillar tunnel that might be three feet wide and two feet tall or three feet high. Um, but the tunnel is there to do, do two things, protect them from the winter and cold and also to keep from getting overwatered. So I would definitely pre-soak them and if you can do it, grow them in a tunnel or in a high tunnel. Michael and Kim's garden. I have apple blossom amaryllis growing outside. I would like to dig one up and grow it inside during the winter. I'm in zone 8B. Uh, when would you best time to dig the bulb and then uh, let it rest and then regrow it again for it to have it bloom probably for Christmas or New Year's is what you're probably aiming for to flower them. If they're growing outside for the summer, you wanna stop them growing or start the storage, air, storage period in early September because you wanna give them about six to eight weeks of rest in a cool area, 45, 55 degrees, and then put them so he's warm, 70 degrees, 24 hours a day to wake them up and get them growing. And then once you put them in that warm spot, they usually bloom in about six to eight weeks. So if you're trying for you know late December, you wanna start the growing process again in early November, second week of November. But the trick is to give them that cool 50 degree range to rest for six to eight weeks. And then when you wanna get them growing again, really warm. 70 degrees, 24 hours a day. Don't water them with cold water, use lukewarm water, and that'll get them growing. Uh, Chris wants to know, what's the best outlets do you recommend for selling peonies? Well, if you can sell retail, which would be at a, at a farmer's market or you know a pick your own or a, uh, a CSA or um, okay subscription, that's gonna get you the highest price. If you can sell to florists, that's the medium price you're gonna get, and then if you want to sell to a wholesaler, you'd have to have tons and tons of peonies, as in thousands and thousands. You could sell to a wholesaler, but a wholesaler is going to pay you maybe a 90 cents to a dollar, a dollar ten a flower. Um, at a farmer's market, you can charge four dollars. I know in New York City area, they charge five and six dollars a flower. But it all depends on how many you're growing and what your sales channels are already. You know, if you're already only selling at farmer's markets, that's where you want to sell your peonies. If you're only selling the florist, then that's where you want to sell your, your peonies is to your florist. But a lot of it can depend on how many you're growing. If you're only growing 25 plants, that's very different than if you have a field of 500 or 1,000 plants. If you have 1,000 plants, you're going to be able, you're going to need to sell a lot of peonies because that 1,000 plants will give you 10 to 15, maybe 20,000 flowers a year once they're established. And that's when you might start looking at selling to a wholesaler. It's a lower price, but you can move a lot more at one time. But then also the wholesaler is very picky on the quality, the stem length. The plants have to be disbudded. A wholesaler would never buy a peony that was not disbudded. They want one stem, one flower, and that's it. So you got to figure out your the volume of what you're growing and then who's going to give you the most uh, financial return overall. In other words, the wholesaler might pay you less, but you might make more money because you can sell them 10,000 of them. Your florist might pay you more, but they're only going to buy 300 throughout the season. Sand Hill Bloomers uh, just got the tulips planted after two frost back in the mid 70s and 80s through November. Do I wait to plant more? Uh, the petal field, is it too late to direct sow cool flowers zone 9B? Um, definitely not. 9B direct sowing, 9B is still warm down there. You're not getting anywhere near frost yet. Um, so definitely yeah, go out and plant your cool, cool season flowers to direct sow them. The only thing you wouldn't do is ones that are normally not direct sown. It's too late to do things like the uh, Sweet William or uh, Rebecca that you want to start plants and put out. It's probably too late to start that, but definitely plenty of time in zone, zone 9B to still direct sow seeds for cool season flowers. Heaven Scent Flower Farm. Do I need to hop, hoop and cover eucalyptus and phenomenal lavender, lavender in Texas zone 8B? No, you should not. Um, both of those should be fine in 8B. The phenomenal lavender goes down, I want to say, at zone 6, maybe even 5. Um, so no need to cover them. The only thing is if the lavender is an area that does not drain well in the winter, that would be not, not be good. Lavender does not like wet, uh, wet soil or wet roots in the wintertime. So as long as you have good drainage, your lavender should be fine. Um, one word of caution with the eucalyptus in zone 8B, it's going to grow into be a tree because all the eucalyptus varieties are really trees. So make sure you keep it cut down next spring when it starts to grow. Um, so before it grows in the spring, you wanna cut it down to knee high or maybe even a little bit lower. And then don't let it get too big next summer because uh, a eucalyptus in zone 8B can be 10 or 12 feet tall if you don't cut it back in June or July. So don't let it get too tall on you. 
do you have ideas for underplanting for peonies? Um, I know people who grow daffodils around their peonies because the daffodils are done are up and blooming while the peonies are only maybe four or five inches tall. And then when the daffodils are done, um, it's just the greens there around the peonies and it doesn't hurt them. And the daffodils die back around the time you're picking the peonies or soon after. So it doesn't hurt to put those two together, but you don't want to plant anything right up against the peony plants. So um, as far as like an annual, some things like that, I wouldn't, I can't think of any annual I would want to plant around uh, peonies, but the daffodils do work to do that. And the daffodils are, you know, a long-term perennial type bulb. Again, you would keep it, you know, a foot away from the peonies. So you don't want to disturb the peony roots when you're planting the daffodils. And you want to make sure they're not going to compete with each other later. Are pansies and violas cool flowers? Any recommendations on or tips in germinating and growing longer stems on these flowers in zone 9b? Um, yeah, pansies and violas are what you consider a cool flower. You're most likely going to plant out plants, not, um, you wouldn't direct sow seeds. So treat, treat it like when you're doing like a sweet William or a uh, Rebecca, you want to put out actual plants. Um, the trick to getting longer stems is plant them closer together. Um, if you look at pansies planted in the landscape, they're planting you know, 8, 10, 12 inches apart. You want to plant them 5, 6 inches apart, maybe even closer. So they're going to outgrow each other and stretch. Um, and then if you can give them a little bit of shade, that always makes things grow taller. And by that, I mean, if you put them someplace where they're going to have sun all winter, but in the springtime, some tree might uh, give them some shade as the tree gets leaves on it. But both pansies and violas do not like hot weather especially the pansies, those will die back sooner. Once you have nights above 60, the pansies usually start to shut down and the viola is usually another three or four weeks after that. Um, so it's not a summertime crop, um, especially you're down in zone uh, 9B. So it's gotta be a, an early spring crop for you, probably February, March and April is when you'll be getting the flowers. But planting them close together makes a big difference on that. Neighbors flower farm, how aggressively should the nine bark be pruned in the spring? Pretty aggressive, down to knee high. Um, even though that plant might have been six or seven feet tall, knee high. Pretty much any woody that you're growing as a cut stem, you want to pretty aggressively prune it back in the spring before it grows, except for the ones that produce flowers or berries on old wood that grew last year. And that would be winterberry holly, um, hydrangeas, except for the limelight, but the macrophylla hydrangeas, viburnum, they all bloom on old wood. Lilac blooms on old wood, so you don't want to be aggressive pruning on those. But anything that either is just a foliage plant or um, like the willows, curly willow, pussy willow, cut them down to knee high and you'll get tons more of stems and great new growth the next year. What are my top woodies for zone nine? Um, well, that rules out lilac, uh, most hydrangeas. You could do the limelight hydrangeas in zone nine. Um, they would benefit from some shade. Um, I know grower in Canada that actually grows them under shade cloth, so he gets the perfect flowers. Um, it's basically a shade structure out in the field to, uh, to shade the hydrangeas. Curly willow will grow anywhere. Pussy willow would work in zone nine. Um, your nine bark should work. Um, smoke bush should work. So there's lots of different foliages and woodies you can grow. On a small batch, Hawaii is asking, violas and pansies are not the same. No, they're technically not the same. It's not like a viola is a miniature version of the pansy. They are technically different plants, different types of plants. Garden Journey Vermont says, I think I killed my pride of Moderna by disturbing the main root. Can I recover? If you've disturbed, if it's, well, it, you would know if it's dead or alive, if it's still actively putting out new growth or if the leaves are all dead. Um, the worst you can do is just leave it and see if it comes back in the spring. How many years can you expect tulips and daffodils to return if cutting each year? Tulips are a one-time crop. You plant it this fall, pick it next spring, and it is done. You will not have a tulip grow back and produce another flower. It just does not work. Uh, don't waste your time trying. <laughs> you know, um, In the landscape, they might come back occasionally, but you're not harvesting them. And they're also not coming back the same quality you need as a good cut flower. So a tulip is a one-time cut and done. or actually pull and done. You don't cut it. You pull them to get more length out of it. But pull them, sell them, and you're done, and replant next year. Always plant in a new location to help uh, reduce the chance of uh, tulip fire or other diseases for tulips. You always rotate. You should rotate any of your crops. Um, and daffodils, they go five, six years, sometimes longer, because the daffodils actually multiply and stay there for years. You don't plant them as close together as tulips. You plant those with three or four or five inches between the bulbs so they have room to grow. The other thing I always like to say is when you're buying uh, daffodil bulbs, it's worth it to buy the biggest bulb you can get 
because the bigger the bulb, the more stems that bulb will put out and you make more money off that extra stem than the cost difference of the small bulb versus the big bulb. When, when planting digitalis plugs, do I thin them back to one plant in the spring or leave the extra to grow like you do with snapdragons? Um, if it's only one or two plants, leave it as one or two plants. It won't matter. If it's, you know, got five plants in that plug, I would thin them out. Um, but if it's only one or two plants per plug, when you're planting them out, go ahead and leave the, the duplicate there. It won't hurt. So my nursery says nine barks is only good through zone seven. Is there a specific variety for zone nine? I'd have to double check that. I was just talking off the top of my head without double checking. I thought nine bark would still work in zone nine. If your nursery is local nursery is saying it's not good, then then don't do it. But sometimes I always like to say, you can always push the envelope a little bit, especially going that direction. If something doesn't grow in zone nine, but it's good in zone eight, it's worth a try. Don't plant 500 of them, plant two or three and see if they work. If it's something you really think you want to grow and, and be able to uh, sell. Oh, here we go. What do you recommend to grow in tunnels for winter blooms in zone six? Well, you're not going to get any blooms, actual flowers you can pick in zone six in the winter. It's just not going to happen. Um, I like to say you can't have any flowers to harvest if it's going to be freezing in that tunnel. So you're not going to be able to actually go out and pick flowers for Valentine's in zone six or zone seven even, probably not even in zone eight because it still gets below freezing sometimes in that tunnel. And some plants like a snapdragon or a ranunculus can take cold weather on the leaves and they can freeze lightly, but the flowers themselves and the flowers and the buds, they can't freeze. So if you're trying to have flowers in zone six to bloom in the winter time, you have to have supplemental heat in there so it never freezes. Now, if you're talking things to overwinter in that tunnel, you can do ranunculus, anemones, snapdragons, dusty miller, um, larkspur can go in there. All these different cool season flowers can go in there. Um, Sweet William, the Rebecca, they can overwinter in there, but you're not going to be harvesting flowers in cold weather below freezing unless you have a heated structure. Oh, how to propagate winterberry. Winterberry is actually grown from rooted cuttings. So if you wanted to root your own cutting, shoot it with softwood cuttings, which is the new growth in the early, late spring, early summer. But the other thing with winterberry, it's really important to know, you got male plants and female plants. So you don't want to be taking cuttings off of a male plant expecting to get berries later. Um, I'm not going to teach about the birds and the bees, but you got to have a male, male holly to pollinate your female holly plants. That's why it's usually best to buy those. And you can have one male holly will pollinate hundreds of female plants within a football field distance away. So it's not like you have to buy, you know, 50 male plants and 50 female. One to two male plants will usually pollinate your whole farm. In zone 7A, South Jersey, can I have my regular tulip bulbs in crates in my cool cold frame tunnel? It sounds like you're trying to grow them in the bulb crates in a tunnel over the, in a cold frame over the winter. You can do that. The only thing is you have to be careful that the um, they don't get too hot during the day. It's just like growing in a tunnel. You have to ventilate that tunnel every day the sun is shining. Um, you know, if you look at old, old pictures of when they used to have the, the glass topped um, cold frames, they always be propped open during the day. Cause otherwise, you're going to cook everything that's in there. So, yes, you can grow tulips in the crates in a cold frame in zone seven, but you have to vent them every day and don't let them get cooked during the, the sunny weather. Do you have a recommendation for woody plant source, particularly interested in hydrangeas and nine bark? Well, woody plants, you usually buy them either as a liner, which is really small, and those you can get through um, Spring Meadows Nursery. They're the, a, a, a propagator for proven winter varieties. There's lots of good proven winter shrubs that work as cut flowers. So you can get those through Spring Meadows Nursery, and they sell them in the, the plug trays or a liner tray. You get, I think it's 72 plants per variety. Or you can go to a local nursery. Um, I know last year I went to a, a local nursery here in the Mid-Atlantic, and I bought some hydrangeas that were 75% off. So I paid like $6, I think it was, for a, a two-gallon hydrangea. And they were amazingly beautiful this summer. So check your local nurseries. Not usually Home Depot and Lowe's. They don't usually put them on sale. Um, if they do, they're usually dead. But a, a local, independently-owned nursery usually puts them on, all their plants on sale this time of the year. And you can get some great deals on those. Um, if you're looking for a whole lot of uh, woody shrubs, there's a place in Ohio called Willow Bend Nursery. It's wholesale only. You have to spend $3,000, I think, is the minimum order. But they have amazing prices on bare root shrubs. You order them this fall, they deliver them to you in the spring. And some of those, you plant them in March, and you'll be harvesting flowers off of them that same year. 
and they've got lilac, hydrangeas, willows, nine bark. They got everything you can imagine as a uh, woody shrub. So um, remember the class that I have, Bob's Woody's Perennials and More, along with Lisa's class. You can always go to thegardenersworkshop.com and you'll find the information there on all the classes and all the other stuff that Lisa uh, and the Gardeners Workshop provides basically for free. There's so much videos and information on that website that's a, almost like an encyclopedia in itself. So with that, I'm going to call it quits and I think we're done. Um, thank you all much. I'm sure I'll be back here in a few months to do this again. Thanks everybody for coming to visit. Did you know that the Gardener's Workshop offers cut flower seeds? Our hand-picked selection includes only the varieties we grow in our own fields and gardens, and each pack is printed with our exclusive growing tips and insights. So visit us at thegardenersworkshop.com today. The Gardener's Workshop, turning all thumbs green.